Um, all right, so I'll start by first of all acknowledging that I am joining you on Kamayako country up in the North Shore in Sydney. And I wanted to acknowledge that uh, sovereignty was never ceded, that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Of course, today is Mabo Day. And I want to acknowledge this landmark um, moment in, in our country's history where the myth of Tara and Alias was overturned by the High Court in 1993. And this legal fiction paved the way for land rights and native title in this country. But of course, there's so much more to go. We are still living with the consequences of Australia's settler colonial crimes, the past of which is reflected in many of the struggles that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people still face today. So I wanted to acknowledge that first and welcome you all again, wherever you're joining us from all the countries around Australia. This series is the final in a series of uh, webinars being hosted by Independent and Peaceful Australia um, on the Australia-US Alliance. And today's topic is on political and democratic rights. I wanted to thank Independent and Peaceful Australia Network uh, who asked me to host today's session. I'm Rowana Raff from the Australian Centre for International Justice. I met um, Annette Brownlee and Kelly Tranter um, through a coalition, a loose coalition called the Australian Arms Control Co Coalition, which is a loose network, like I said, of organisations working on peace and justice issues in Australia and all around the world. And we formed in response to the lack of transparency around Australia's arms exports to the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, which is being used devastatingly um, in Yemen. I'm from the Australian Centre for International Justice. We are a legal centre. Uh, we have been around for two and a half years now, and our main focus is to try and uh, push on global justice issues in Australia and uh, primarily to invigorate uh, Australia's ability to conduct investigations and prosecutions of the international crimes offences, otherwise known as war crimes, genocide and crimes against humanity um, in our Commonwealth Criminal Code. And to that end, our main work is uh, around now on the Special Forces War Crimes by Australian Special Forces in Afghanistan. And we come from a victim's rights perspective. So we're working really hard on, on making sure that victims are able to participate in the forthcoming uh, accountability processes um, that have begun. Um, we also work on uh, Palestine. Most recently, we joined with Palestinian human rights organizations across the West occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip, including in East Jerusalem, um, to put in a submission to the Department of Foreign Affairs as they are conducting a feasibility study on uh, whether on, an, on entering into a free trade agreement with Israel. So I encourage you to have a look at that submission on our website. Um, and one thing I am going to ask you to do before we jump into um, hearing Kelly and Greg uh, speak to us tonight is sign a petition that was drafted by BDS Australia and uh, I helped them as well with the drafting this submission um, and I'm going to put it in the chat and I'm going to ask you to sign it um, sometime this evening and I'm also going to ask you to send it to five of your family and friends in Australia so that we can get as many people signing this petition as possible the petition is hosted on the Australian Parliament website and it is a set of concrete tasks to the Australian Parliament. So I'll pop that in the chat very soon. Um, uh, one of the things I wanted to state on the issue of Palestine, of course, because it touches on this Australia-US uh, alliance, um, is this, this, this Australian government, which we all know is the most pro-Israeli government in Australian history, I guess you could say, uh, one of the issues that we work on uh, with other groups here in Australia, but also Palestinian human rights organisations, is Australia's uh, complicity with Israel's crimes. And we know Israel's crimes uh, can, only be, uh, can only happen with the support of the United States and the uh, uh, um, support of countries like Australia and the UK and, and Europe in encouraging Israel's impunity. And one of the things that Australia, to our great shame, did last year was intervene at the International Criminal Court at the request of the Israeli government. And I say that because 
in Senate estimates last year, DFAT officials did reveal that the Israeli government and other governments, and we suspect the US government was one of those, that requested Australia to take this step and try and prevent an investigation into war crimes and crimes against humanity in Palestine from occurring. Now, thankfully, the International Criminal Court's pretrial chamber rejected this position by Australia and a few other states. Um, and uh, the investigation is now going ahead. And it looks like it will be looking at the crimes that we just saw um, in the latest onslaught on the Gaza Strip. And of course, the ethnic cleansing that we're seeing being perpetrated against Palestinian communities in occupied East Jerusalem. Um, so that's what I wanted to state there. And I am now going to open it to um, Kelly Tranter. Um, Kelly is chairing the People's Inquiry. I might add also that um, IPAN is conducting an important People's Inquiry, which closes, I think, in July, and we'll get those details for you later on. Um, and it's encouraging anybody to make, also, uh, to make a submission to the inquiry. And it can be as long as one line, one paragraph, um, and up to, I think, 5,000 words. So ACIJ is uh, about to start working on our, on our submission. So I would encourage uh, you all to also consider making a submission to this People's Inquiry. And it's being chaired by the wonderful Kelly Tranter. Um, Kelly is chairing the People's Inquiry. She's a lawyer, a human rights activist, who regularly contributes political and social commentary to public affairs, websites like ABC's The Drum, Independent Australia, National Times and Online Opinion, and has written for New Matilda and Australia Institute. I know Kelly as um, an excellent researcher and also a bit of an FOI gun, um, I think. <laughs> Um, so uh, she's a uh, really um, a wonderful person and lawyer to know, and I'm glad to be introducing her. So Kelly is going to look at the essential nature of information in the context of political and democratic rights and securing justice. And we'll also be talking about her work on the Julian Assange case as an illustrative example of the above. Um, so I'll just ask you all one more time to make sure um, that you remain on mute and if you have any questions to also pop them in the chat. Thanks so much, Kelly. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I wish to, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, uh, and in my case, that's the Wanaroa people. Uh, I pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past and present and to leaders yet to emerge and acknowledge that the land was never ceded. Uh, it really is a pleasure to have with us this evening Rowan. Uh, she is a remarkable woman. Um, it's one thing to recognise a need, uh, but she went on to single-handedly establish the Australian Centre for International Justice, which is Australia's first dedicated legal centre providing strategic advice and representation to people seeking justice and accountability. Um, it's also a pleasure to participate in this webinar with Greg Barnes, <laughs> Uh, who so often raises his voice on difficult issues and cases uh, where many struggle to find the courage to do the same. Before my presentation, I would like to thank all of you for tuning in this evening and encourage you to put in a submission to the inquiry, particularly because as it stands, uh, we don't get to vote on foreign policy and in fact, it's not democratically decided and, and that must change. Tonight's webinar centres on political and democratic rights. I don't profess to be an expert um, on the topic and Rowan and Greg possess in equal measure far more expertise in the subject, but I would like to make some broad observations on the topic from an information perspective and by reference to the case of Julian Assange. As I said at a public uh, event recently, since 2010, uh, I have spoken at rallies and formal events, published opinion pieces, written open letters to parliamentarians, including the crossbenchers in 2015, had lengthy com uh, confidential conversations with um, Assange's family members, issued countless freedom of information requests in recent times with uh, Julian's signed authority, and stood shoulder to shoulder with Assange in an election, which of course Greg um, coordinated. Too often society forgets that information is the currency of democracy. 
That's something Assange has long understood. He observed that for, while, for quote, for wide scale injustice, you need systematization of unjust policies. And to systematize unjust policies, you have to have a paper trail. In 2006, Assange wrote State and Terrorist Conspiracies, which he said was a discussion paper of what would happen when WikiLeaks really went into action. Assange explains, would it be the case that powerful organizations that were exposed would simply take everything off paper, that we would just incentivize them to take everything off paper so that we might have a win for a little while for justice, but then ultimately the system would restructure itself such that we would not be able to continue having successes with that sort of approach. And what I found was that that was very unlikely and that large centralized institutions are that way because they have developed their internal system, which is able to come to a central policy decision and spread it within the network or within the institution and then have it implemented. And to do that properly, there needs to be rapid and accurate internal communication. And that means having things on paper or having things on email. On the one hand, they can take everything off paper, he said, almost all things off paper or some things off, off paper or lock things down in expensive security protocols and safes and encrypted transmissions. And as a result, be very inefficient and hence contract their power and reduce their competitiveness, both at a commercial level and an intergovernmental level, or they can be more open and simply do things that are less embarrassing, do things that don't outrage people when they are exposed. He said, it's quite a good choice of course, we are still a long way from that being enforced mandatory choice for everybody. And that's the way we're trying to push things and we are succeeding. In other words, the erosion of political and democratic rights can't take place over long lunches or on golf courses alone. It requires a team of participants in human institutions, whether they're willing or not. The taking of calls, the typing of notes, the drafting and delivery of documents, the communication of instructions, informal conversations in earshot, advice sought and given, people coming and going from offices and activities cloaked in secrecy. War, for instance, requires secrecy. The threat is public knowledge of what the government is up to, the motivations, the instructions, the orders, the policy planning and anticipated outcomes and consequences. So representatives think their decisions and thinking must be free from public scrutiny. We see this playing out on a regular basis. To illustrate on the 16th of May this year, the Asia Pacific Defence Reporter revealed that the new Minister for Defence, Peter Dutton, issued an instruction to the department ordering the following extremely restrictive measures when responding to requests for information. Responses are to be as brief and succinct as possible. Guidance is to limit responses to three paragraphs, regardless of the breadth of the questions. Additional information can be offered on background. Capability related interviews are unlikely to be approved be rigidly flexible to revert to written responses. The recent Senate report on press freedom found that freedom of information laws are often produced documents so redacted that they are useless. And that is certainly my experience. And the prosecutions of Afghan files whistleblower David McBride and of Bernard Caleri, witness K and Richard Boyle, sends a clear message to whistleblowers. These are all telltale signs that in response to whistleblowers and unsanctioned disclosures, our government has not elected to be more open and simply do things that are less embarrassing, do things that don't outrage people when they're exposed, as Assange suggested. In 2019, The Atlantic reported that the publication of the WikiLeaks diplomatic cables has changed the way diplomats communicate. Current and former Western diplomats claim that the diplomatic cables primacy is bring, being threatened, replaced by informal emails and telephone briefings as well as an, by an array of, of ad hoc forms of communication, some official, some unofficial, that are changing the way the, diplo the diplomacy is conducted. Sensitive information, which might previously have been included cables, is now being copied and pasted into WhatsApp messages and distributed among small circles of trusted officials. Important communications are being shared on private email accounts outside the official systems of surveillance Government issued laptops are being abandoned for the anonymity of airport computer stations to communicate with foreign governments in moments of crisis. From the point of view of political and democratic rights and transparency and accountability, it is of concern that diplomats, senior officials and politicians are secretly communicating in ways that cannot be recorded, 
captured in documents susceptible to freedom of information laws, or even archived for future record. Preserving an historical record is fundamental because without a true history, the meaning of our entire existence is amenable to a complete rewrite. History grounds us in thousands of years of experience of the consequences of bad behavior and human stupidity. And history truly recorded makes that available for all to see and learn from. This defensive approach certainly infringes what I consider our democratic rights and ultimately may result in inefficiencies and contraction of power in political organizations that Assange hypothesized. Information being the currency of democracy, Assange and his small team have made a significant deposit into the accounts of all global citizens, each and every one of us. People all over the world have used WikiLeaks publications to enforce their political and democratic rights to secure justice. In 2018, there was the UK court ruling that WikiLeaks documents can be used as evidence. That was in the case being brought by the Chagos refugees group on behalf of the Chagos Islanders, expelled from their home in the Indian Ocean by the United Kingdom in the 1960s, 70s to make way for a US Air Force base. You may also recall that in a case of mistaken identity, Khaled Al Nasri, a German citizen was abducted by the CIA from the Macedonian border in 2004 and abused and tortured. Diplomatic cables were crucial to the outcome of his case in the European Court of Human Rights. Of course, the sad irony in the Assange matter, saying that to systematize unjust policies that impact upon political and democratic rights, you have to have a paper trail is that there could be no clearer example than in his own case. Information produced under freedom of information laws and from various other sources have revealed that the government received the February 2016 report of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, which found that Julian had been arbitrarily detained by Sweden and the United Kingdom since his arrest in London on the 7th of December 2010. The expert panel called on the Swedish and British authorities to end Julian's deprivation of liberty, respect his physical integrity and freedom of movement and afford him the right to compensation. They sought and received legal advice, but have kept it secret and otherwise remained silent. In 2019, the government became aware of the report from the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nils Melzer, confirming that Julian shows all the symptoms of someone exposed to prolonged psychological ill treatment. He had been deliberately exposed for a period of several years to progressively severe forms of cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, the cumulative effects of which can only be described as psychological torture. No action was taken by our government. There was not even a formal acknowledgement of the report's findings. The government is aware of evidence of illegal spying on Julian and his Australian lawyers in the Ecuadorian embassy and the confiscation of his personal and other records which ended up in the hands of the prosecuting state. They remain silent, notwithstanding their general claims of making sure he would be fairly treated under law. In May 2019, Assange told DFAT officials that he was concerned about surviving the current process and feared that he would die if he was taken to the United States. Consular officers noticed that he appeared to have lost weight. An October 2019 DFAT report of court proceedings didn't mention either his weight loss or his inability to say his own name or date of birth, which was widely reported. In November 2019, Julian told consular officials he was suffering from sensory deprivation and that he was dying. He said that his psychological state was so bad that his mind was shutting down. And at the Senate inquiry in March, a question that discomforted the then, oh, sorry, the the Foreign Affairs Minister, Maurice Payne, which she had to take on notice, asked whether or not our government knew that Julian was on suicide watch at Belmarsh Prison. That was at a time when they retained his authority to obtain information in relation to his health and well-being. So they couldn't use the often repeated claim of lacking authority to assist him. Answering it gave rise to a dilemma. If they knew, why didn't they do anything to help him? If they didn't, how could they claim to be looking after his interests as an Australian citizen? How can they wriggle out of that? The formal response given this week was refusal to disclose whether they knew 
relying on some vague privacy issue. Subsequently, I've had to issue another FOI calling for, for the material in question. Some other areas in which the government has refused to produce information in the Assange case includes information between the foreign minister and her overseas counterparts, a cable titled US Australian American Relations, a snapshot insofar as it relates to Assange. Uh, and I'm sure Greg will talk more about um, any consideration of the implications for the Alliance in the Assange case. Any information that discloses a predetermined position or opinion or that to their mind may affect international relations or has a substantial, substantial adverse effect on the proper and efficient conduct of the operations of the department. So we're left in a situation where our government is playing the secrecy game and playing it with people's lives. They're doing the best they can to avoid scrutiny, particularly in situations like Julian Assange's, where the perception of the national interest, which they refuse to truthfully share with us, requires acts or inaction, which may have devastating personal consequences. And by behaving in that way, they are trashing not only Assange's political and human rights, but also the political and democratic rights of all of us, of the citizens to whom they are supposed to be accountable. If their decisions and actions were principled and just, there would be no need to shroud them in secrecy. Uh, and on that note, I hand the matter, I hand the, the floor over to you, Rowan. Thank you. Brilliant, Kelly, thank you so much. That was really instructive. Um, and I think you're right, it, you were able to really flesh out how uh, the case of Julian Assange is illustrative of all of those, the, those issues. And I think that now I'm going to hand that over to Greg Barnes SC. Um, Greg is a, a leading the panel on political and democratic rights in the People's Inquiry. He is a democratic and human rights barrister, advisor to the Julian Assange campaign, and past president of the Australian Republican Movement and the Australian Lawyers Association. Greg is going to be speaking to us about uh, what the Julian Assange case tells us about the US and Australia relationship. Thank you very much, Greg. Well, thanks very much, uh, Rowan. And can I um, start by paying my respects to the traditional original owners of the uh, land that I am on, the Moonwana uh, land, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and of course, uh, that uh, acknowledging that uh, the Aboriginal people of Tasmania are the custodians of this land. Um, thank you uh, very much, Kelly, for uh, yet another highly informative, but importantly uh, detailed uh, recitation of the way in which uh, legislation such as Freedom of Information Act um, is misused uh, by governments, uh, notoriously so. Uh, and uh, Kelly's work in this area um, has demonstrated uh, yet again the lack of uh, transparency on the part of the Australian government, not just Australian government, the state governments and territory governments have become uh, infected with the same disease. Um, and particularly in relation to cases where you have people, Australians who are vulnerable and overseas, there's even more of a requirement to be honest and transparent, uh, not only for uh, those who are advocating in relation to those individuals, but to ensure and to assure Australians that uh, if you are uh, caught in trouble overseas, that your government is going to somehow protect you to the best of its ability. That's not happened in this particular case or in a number of other cases. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about the case, the Assange case, but also then the, the broader issue of extradition uh, and the extradition treaty between Australia and the United States uh, and the impact of that treaty and a potential impact of, of that treaty on any person uh, here tonight any journalist in Australia, uh, any uh, advocate, any NGO, uh, if it uh, uh, dared to publish uh, what the Americans and the Australians would like to keep secret. But firstly, just in relation to the Assange case, what does it say about the alliance? Well, you can look at this uh, two ways. You could take the view that what it shows is yet again, uh, how um, craven 
uh, and pathetic in the true sense of that word Australia is in this alliance. That is that Australia's capacity to stand up for itself and for its citizens when it comes to the United States uh, has always been, uh, with brief exceptions, uh, particularly during the early years of the Whitlam government, uh, has always been a case where Washington says jump and we jump and say how high. Uh, it is rare for Australia to stand up to the United States, and if it does so, it quickly gets brought back into line. The Assange case is a, a very good example of this. It's a, the reason it's a good example is because the default position of Julia Gillard when she was Prime Minister was to blame Assange and then see if there are any Australian offences that he was alleged to have committed, of course. He, there weren't any, but that default position has been uh, demonstrated on the part of every government since, every foreign minister since, and every prime minister since. Now, uh, this is a case of fundamental importance because it goes to the values that we say uh, we hold dear. One, the rule of law, uh, and two, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Now, we say, and we give lip service to these phrases often, uh, you know, our political leaders are very fond of talking about uh, what makes us different from China is that uh, we believe in the rule of law and we believe in uh, uh, liberal democracy and the freedoms that go with it. And yet, of course, when it's tested, and particularly when it's tested in the context of the United States, we cavil, we don't cavil. Uh, we put ourselves in a position no different to a provincial government in the context of an authoritarian central government. That is, Washington uh, dictates the terms of the alliance and always has and always will. It's, you know, it's no surprise that people like Paul Keating as a former prime minister, uh, that people like um, Malcolm Fraser as a former prime minister came to the view that the alliance ought to be jettisoned and jettisoned for a good reason. And that is because of the position of subservience and because of the fact that it was counterintuitive and counterproductive in a region which values independence, for example, in the case of New Zealand. The case of Assange also demonstrates the fact that Australia and the Australian policy making circles are so embedded with uh, their United States counterparts in Washington and the Washington machine, war and security and otherwise, that uh, it's, I think it's fair to say that if an Australian, any Australian citizen gets into trouble in the United States, the chances of you being assisted by your government are much less than if you were found you're finding yourself in trouble, for example, in this region. Uh, and that's despite the fact that one would expect that two societies committed to the rule of law would ensure that in relation to each, uh, a person from uh, each country who finds himself in trouble and detained uh, would, of course, be given roll gold service by their diplomatic uh, services and uh, that that would be the expectation on the part of Canberra and of Washington. But it doesn't happen. What we know, of course, is that in relation not just to Assange, but also as Edward Snowden demonstrated, is that Australia is very comfortable to play the role, uh, not so much of deputy sheriff as factotum in the region. Uh, that is to essentially be there uh, in a servile position uh, whenever the United States security uh, uh, elements indicate that, for example, they want a big sweep on intelligence. Australia is also is one of the first to put its hand up and say, we'll help, me too. We know that from uh, the, what happened uh, with the release of material by Edward Snowden. We know also that this alliance uh, is hostile to people like Assange, at not just at the political level, but also at the broader level of the relationship. Take, for example, the Lowy Institute. The Lowy Institute, uh, which, um, as some have said, is essentially a retirement home for DFAT and ASIO, um, is run by Michael Fullerlove. Michael Fullerlove is extremely hostile to Julian Assange and always has been. 
Uh, why? Because the Lowy Institute is embedded uh, into the US-Australian alliance. Uh, that's why you get uh, silence on the part of uh, many people in the foreign policy establishment, the think tanks, et cetera, in relation to Assange, because they are embedded. And being embedded with the United States is much more important than standing up for fundamental values like freedom of speech and the rule of law. Let me, let me uh, broaden this a little now, having talked about the Assange case, uh, or actually before I go there, let me, let me put an alternative view uh, and then I'll come to the broader question. Uh, Bob Carr, as you know, the former foreign minister, to his credit, uh, has begun to uh, articulate and advocate for Julian Assange. And uh, I've been fairly close to Bob in assisting him uh, in that regard over uh, the period of the last couple of years. He makes a fundamentally good point, though. If you see the alliance as something which can be useful, and if you see the alliance in terms of it being a case that the United States has no loyaler ally than Australia, then why wouldn't you prevail upon the United States to say the Assange case has gone on long enough? Uh, he's been, his health is destroyed. There is no public interest in pursuing this matter. And most importantly, what he did was expose war crimes, which, by the way, we are now looking at prosecuting in the context of Afghanistan in Australia. So that's the, that's the alternative view. And it's a compelling view. And Carr has articulated on a number of occasions, and he's right to articulate it. So I say to those who see the alliance as valuable, uh, as opposed to those of us who don't see it as valuable, if, but if you do see it as valuable, and that's a view that some people hold and they're entitled to hold, then you ought to be saying to them, as Carr does, well, why wouldn't you prevail upon your United States colleagues if you think the alliance is of such great use, this is the very time that you ought to be prevailing on the United States to do the right thing by an Australian citizen. Let me turn now more broadly to the issue of extradition. So um, as we know, uh, a number of Australian journalists and others like Kelly and uh, uh, others in the community have uh, over the years uh, been very successful at uh, revealing what governments would rather us not see or hear uh, or read. Uh, and you've heard uh, what uh, uh, Peter Dutton is doing in relation to the Department of Defence and more broadly the way in which the subversion of, of um, uh, the information record is happening, as Kelly has uh, eloquently described. Now, uh, the issue here is uh, one about what would happen uh, if an Australian citizen uh, revealed, for example, key information about Pine Gap, including, for example, names of personnel, uh, what's happening at Pine Gap on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, or revealed, for example, communications between Pine Gap and uh, 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 Australian D Defence Signals uh, Directorate? They would, no doubt, uh, there'd be uh, charges laid under Commonwealth Criminal Code and Commonwealth Crimes Act. But there might also be, if, for example, uh, it involved the communication of that information to someone in the United States or to a media organisation in the United States, there's no doubt in my view that there would be an extradition request from the United States to Australia. The Assange case, of course, tells us that that would be, would be so, because the Assange case is a case in which the United States is saying that we will seek to extradite a person whose only connection with the United States is an alleged conspiracy with a, a United States citizen uh, in order to reveal uh, war crimes. Uh, this person, Assange, has not set foot in the United States, and the only connection to the jurisdiction is a tenuous and unproven one. But we will use the Espionage Act, uh, which is a 1917 Act in the United States, in order to seek to extradite Assange so that he can be prosecuted. And that is what we call extraterritorial reach. There is nothing stopping the United States doing that in relation to any one of us. Um, now, uh, that's because under the extradition treaty between Australia and the United States, 
Uh, and, and interestingly, Australia didn't seek to, uh, the United States didn't seek a new treaty uh, with Australia as it did with the UK after 9-11. Uh, it relied on, it, it felt that it had enough within the existing Australian treaty, which was first formed in 1974, uh, to deal with the post 9-11 environment. But uh, what the treaty says is that in addition to the list of offences that are, that are set out there in the treaty and which include murder, for example, all sorts of offences, including bigamy, um, uh, drugs, etc., it can, uh, Australia can say there are these other offences which, which are also extraditable. And that, of course, could include uh, what are the equivalents to the Espionage Act in the United States, and that is the provisions of the Commonwealth Crimes Act and Criminal Code, which make an offence uh, to reveal information, and which, for example, now make it an offence to uh, discuss or disclose any element of an ASIO operation, in particular, what is called uh, a special operation, where ASIO can commit otherwise criminal offences and torts against individuals. There is no doubt that there would be a request. And the only thing stopping that extradition would be if a court determined that the purpose for trying uh, the individual was uh, in relation to an offence of a political character. Uh, I have a great regard for the current federal court and uh, some of its excellent judges in there, particularly in the way in which they've pushed back against executive overreach in the area of immigration, but also we saw last week in relation to the area of climate change. But uh, you can dress up these charges as the United Kingdom, as the US lawyers have been doing uh, in the Assange case to say, well, it's not political. Uh, this is about, uh, we're not seeking to curtail freedom of speech or freedom of the press. This is about, this is about hacking. This is about stealing information. So you frame it in a criminal way uh, and you get around the political problem. So uh, one, one point which I think is very important to emphasize is that if you were going to take uh, a view about the US alliance, that said, we want a more respectful relationship. That is one in which uh, we protect Australian citizens and one in which uh, our sovereignty uh, is not continually eroded by uh, the empire. You would in your extradition treaty redraft it so that you took away this possibility because it is a real possibility and the Assange case uh, shows us that it is. Often people say to me, oh, that's extreme. You know, Assange is an exceptional case. Well, not really. I mean, Assange did uh, uh, en masse what others had done in bits and pieces. Uh, and uh, if the Assange case is successful, if the extradition is successful, my own view is I don't think the British, I think the British courts will continue to block it. I, I was proven right. Uh, I said that uh, I didn't think the court would, would extradite him uh, earlier in the year. I was right about that. And I think, I don't think you know, the, the US is going to win its appeal, but it doesn't matter. The stage is set for the United States to try this again, and a particularly aggressive Department of Justice, depending on the administration, might seek to do so, aided and abetted by and encouraged by the Australian government. So that's, uh, Rowan, what I wanted to say, and Kelly, uh, and I'd be very happy to, uh, along with Kelly, of course, we can take questions. Thank you so much, Greg. That was fascinating. Um, and I am uh, being inundated with questions, I think. So I'm going to jump right into it, Greg um, and Kelly. Uh, we'll, we'll go to, first of all, uh, let's have a look here. Stephen Darling asks, uh, is the increasing willingness of govern government ministers, example, Peter Dutton, to sue critics likely to become a more frequently used tactic of suppression, or will they be inhibited by the optics of such an action at all? Do any of you want to have a crack at that one? Well, I think um, I, I think he was very ill-advised to come after Shane Bartsy. And uh, uh, Dutton is, of course, uh, I mean, I've dealt with a lot of ministers and, and I, you know, I deal with a lot of cases uh, involving ministers. Uh, Dutton is... Uh, on his own in terms of his thuggery. I mean, he's, 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 a, he's an authoritarian. He's got little interest in democracy. He's certainly got no interest in freedom of speech. And as I, I, I should repeat what I said, because he's a thug twice. 
uh, it won't stop him, but I, I'm not sure about other ministers. Uh, I think one of the issues is, and Kelly, Kelly uh, will know possibly more about this, that defamation laws are about to be reformed in some way, which may curtail some of these proceedings. Um, but Kelly might want to say something about it. Hi, Greg. No, I haven't heard anything of late, so, and it's not my area of expertise. So I'll defer to your um, your statement. But okay. I would, but but I would like to add in just in relation to the alliance, if you don't mind, um, encourage people to um, read a recent, well, it's a fairly recent document titled um, "Providing for the Common Defence: The Assessment and Recommendations of the National Defence Strategy Commission." Uh, it was published in November two thousand and eighteen. And uh, it had 12 members of Congress, uh, sorry, 12 members which were selected by Congress. So it has some weight and it had a broad cons uh, consensus. Um, and this statement, uh, it said, in reality, US alliances and partnerships have been deeply rooted in American self-interest. Uh, by enlisting other nations in the promotion of a world favorable to the American interests, and then it went on to say, in short, alliances and partnerships rooted in shared interests and mutual respect have reduced the price America pays for global leadership. Now, this is an official US document uh, suggesting that um, it's a one-way street. And I do encourage people to, to look at that, that document just because of its, um, you know, the frankness. It also role plays... Um, war games, um, any actions in the Indo-Pacific region. So I just wanted to, to, to tag, tag that in. Thanks so much, Kelly. I'm going to go to two questions. Uh, Leela, I think, is asking about how long are they able to keep Julian Assange for? And it's something similar that the wonderful Adriana Navarro, hello, um, is also asking. She says, my greatest concern is the use of extremely lengthy and expensive court proceedings by states to retaliate against and effectively destroy the lives of those who, like Assange, have made disclosures in the public interest. Are there, are there any measures which could be taken to curtail the abuse of court processes? Uh, do you want to have a crack at that one, Greg? Sure. Um, look, on, on Assange, it really does depend on uh, a couple of steps. Firstly, uh, on the 7th, which is in four days' time, five days' time, four days' time, uh, the, uh, a single judge of the UK Court of Appeal, which is really equivalent to our Supreme Court uh, in each state, uh, will uh, make a determination as to whether or not there'll be, he'll be given, uh, the Americans will be given leave to appeal against the decision of the magistrate. Uh, the expectation is that they probably will. In other words, there are sufficient legal questions in it in order to go to three judges. Then it goes to three judges. That hearing, I think, will take place in around September. Then there'll be a decision. Uh, it depends then on whether or not the United States continues to pursue the matter. There is some view uh, expressed, and I've had it expressed to me by sources close to the uh, other elements of the campaign, that suggests that Biden might give it, give it up, um, that there's not the same fire in the belly in the Department of Justice or the same people. But it could well go into next year. On the issue of courts being used, if you look at the Bernard Collieri case, Witness K, uh, McBride that Kelly mentioned. Uh, there's a guy over in South Australia, the former ATO official, Doyle or Boyle. You know, uh, and I've been in these cases always on the part of the defendant. Uh, the Commonwealth has vast resources uh, and it, in my view, does not behave as a model litigant in this area. It does in some areas, to be, to be frank, in the way in, I've had very good dealings with it in, in some areas, but not in this area. Uh, and it tends to uh, seek to delay, I think, to wear people down. And uh, I think the delays in the the delays in the Caleri case have been disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful. They wouldn't be tolerated in you know state courts where judges crack the whip more to get cases uh, done. Uh, but it is disgraceful. What can be done to control it? You're really relying on judges and magistrates to be really strict about timelines. Um, and not allow uh, the continual adjournments that uh, that uh, you get. And look, that's easier said than done. It's not a difficult. It's not an easy task. 
Kelly, please feel right if you wanted to come in and. Yeah, look, the, the only thing I'd like to, to, to perhaps uh, add on to the discussions about Assange is that in WikiLeaks has been described as a, described as a, a democratizing force. And what is uh, so extraordinary is the label of a hostile non-state actor for a media organization. Uh, and the publication uh, of information in the, the public interests should be, the, the, the label of hostile non-state actor should be uh, uh, applied to every media organization if they're doing their job. Um, and mm. we need in a democracy, our media organizations not to be an arm of government. So of course, um, what uh, Assange and WikiLeaks achieved should, should not have been unique. Um, and I think we need to remember that this tagline of him being a non, uh, his organisation being a hostile non-state actor really is, is something that, we, that, you know, our media organisations need to do better, far better, um, because otherwise um, the ordinary person uh, has no idea what their government is up to. Um, so I just wanted to chip that in. Thank you. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Kelly and Greg. Um, just to point out before we go into some other questions, there's been a friend joining us from Ireland, the Peace and Neutrality Alliance. Um, and they ask, or they say rather, uh, the news that the Irish Parliament recently passed a resolution declaring Israeli settlements on the West Bank as a de facto annexation. Do you have the details? I imagine he means in relation to Australia. Uh, we've had uh, no statements from Australia just before the anticipated uh, um, an exchange, annexation du jure by Israel last year. There was a um, statement from the from Foreign Minister Maurice Payne about Australia's position, which wasn't a very strong position. Um, but that's where we are. Of course, you're much more advanced in in Ireland. But that's why I want to reiterate again for everybody to please sign the petition. I think widespread public support is so important to keep pushing on the issue of Palestine. Um, in Australia. There's a question from Sam. Uh, to what extent are civil rights, especially around the right to privacy in Australia, are subjected to security and surveillance policies in the US? I'm thinking about the Cloud Act and institutions like Five Eyes. Kelly or Greg, do you want to have, uh, do you have an answer for that? I'll let Kelly take that one. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with that act, uh, so I, I can't provide uh, any insight. But um, I would like to perhaps refer to a statement that Assange himself made, um, if you can just bear with me, um, about um, the geopolitical landscape more generally uh, with regard to surveillance and what have you. He said... Um, that is something that military groups and intelligence organizations um, in various countries want to have, increase their relative power within their nations. So they're wanting to buy into um, surveillance products uh, for a transfer of power. The basic structure that it is that if you're a country and you're not very uh, isolated, uh, you have to sign up to one of the providers of intelligence or another, and be it Russia, the UK, China, um, uh, and uh, US being the market leader. If you don't sign up, uh, you can't really see what's happening around you uh, and who is, who's within your borders. You don't have the access to the geospatial intelligence and information about individuals. Um, and that's what intelligence agencies and military groups desire because uh, in various countries, they want to, to increase their relative power uh, within their own nations. So. He, the suggestion really was that it might not be something that people want, um, but it's how power is consolidated within each nation. Uh, so um, he, um, and then he, he, he went on to um, suggest his concern about uh, artificial intelligence and other things being non-human decisions. So I, I can't answer the, the question directly other than to say that military and intelligence agencies want these products uh, and it sucks out money from the Australian tax base uh, by buying these products. 
um, and um, and obviously to to spy on every citizen. And we've seen the recent decision uh, in this, in uh, relation to the Snowden leaks um, in the UK. But um, I'll I'll hand the floor back to you, Luan. Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, we've got time maybe for one or two questions. I'm going to take this one from Sue Warren. Wonderful Sue, who's from the Medical Association for the Prevention of War. And she asks, would Kelly or Greg like to comment on the fact that the Prime Minister can take Australia to war without Parliament even debating, let alone voting on it? Totally undemocratic, she says. And I think on that point, I'm going to also link uh, the group to the group Australian for War Powers Reform. Um, but I'll put that question back to Kelly or Greg. Well, I mean, I, I think and I think Kelly's involved in this too. I think we've both uh, been pretty involved with Alison Bronowski and the uh, great efforts uh, uh, Paul Barrett and others have made in relation to this issue. Look, uh, I mean, there's no greater decision that a nation makes than to go to war. Uh, and yet uh, uh, this is the decision uh, in respect of which no one has a say except for not even the whole of the executive arm of government, not even the whole ministry. Uh, if, if the prime minister and uh, the defence minister uh, want to go to war, we go to war. And the foreign minister, we go to war. It's appalling. And of course, let's consider this. If we'd had a proper debate about Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and we'd voted down going to war, uh, we would have seen lives saved uh, less, perhaps, of a flood of refugees uh, and Australia being able to hold its head high in the region uh, as an honest broker. Instead, we were seen in the context of those wars as a pathetic, and I'll use that term again, factotum. It's a good word, factotum. Uh, a pathetic factotum who ran off as quickly as we could, along with, you know, the, the supine Tony Blair uh, at George W's bidding. So uh, just think of it in those terms. Don't think of it, even if you don't think of it in terms of the of a democratic values, just think of it in those pragmatic terms. Uh, I would only add that, look, it's outrageous that it's not uh, democratically decided um, I think if um, there was a parliamentary debate, which is the push by uh, the Australian War Powers Reform, uh, and people really had to discuss um, our interests in any particular region, um, the potential losses, the consequences, um, the cost to the country, um, the loss of life, um, the Australian people would never agree to it. And that's why I mentioned in, in, in my speech war requires um, secrecy because every thinking individual um, wouldn't be prepared to sign on. And in fact, this talk of, of war with China, um, I think if we, if we had a, a, a debate within parliament that talked about potential targets in our country, the potential people who may be impacted, the potential loss of life, um, the devastation to our national interests, um, mm. it, it wouldn't happen. And that's why they don't want it to be de democratically decided. Um, they need to keep it uh, out of public sight uh, and mind. So um, I really admire the efforts of AWPR uh, and, um, I, and I think it's getting traction. They've got some good people uh, working on it and, and that's where we need to, to, to head uh, and be more, you know, adroitly deal with our, our foreign policy and, and include the opinions of ordinary Australians. Thanks so much, Kelly. Just one more question before we wrap up from El Samai. Please discuss how the media, News Corp and the Daily Mail, for example, framed the Julian Assange story. He went from hero to villain in coverage. Uh, well, I should declare an interest here. I, I take a check from uh, Rupert. Uh, I write for... Uh, the southernmost and probably the most moderate force in uh, News Limited, the the, uh, the Hobart Mercury, and I and I know that it's a moderate force because I've written a number of articles highly critical of Israel, and I wrote an article two weeks ago saying that journalists should get off the fence about Israel and should start reporting the facts as they did about South Africa, and it wasn't spiked, and in fact I wasn't spoken to about it. 
Um, it was also the, the, just very quickly, it was also the only Murdoch paper around the world that opposed the Iraq war until Hill, Holt Street got at it and it went neutral. Anyway, very quickly, uh, I, I think the Assange case is interesting, you know, because the, the, it, it's also been the, the, the old Fairfax papers, which have been hostile as well, uh, very hostile in many respects. Someone who I won't name here, but Kelly knows, uh, a government, not a government, a, a political staffer who has an interesting journalistic background, once said to me, you've got to understand, journalists hate Assange. And they had Assange because he does, the, he does their job and much better. So there's a lot of it driven by that. Uh, but uh, look, I, I don't think it's just a Murdoch issue. I think it is across the Australian media generally. The ABC haven't been particularly good on it either. Uh, I, I think it's across Australia. And I think it has a variety of reasons for that but i do think one of them is a hostility and this stupid argument that oh, assange is not a journalist which people have, have been running yeah greg i agree with that and i think the other um interesting aspect um from my discussions with several journalists is that um they they there is a self-censorship going on so i i think uh, assange has many more supporters in media um, than we realise, but so many of them engage in self-censorship because the, 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 the prospect of speaking out uh, in favourable terms uh, for Assange um, seems to have this consequence of being labelled some sort of disciple of Assange, not being, um, you know, being uncritical. Uh, and I think that's a great shame because... Um, what he did was right, what Assange did was right. I mean, obviously, um, he did the best he could with the resources he had. And I think um, slowly there's becoming more of an acceptance with it in media quarters that um, uh, what happens to him <laughs> uh, will be their ultimate fate um, if they um, don't speak up on his behalf. But I would ask anyone who might be tuning in uh, in the... In the um, from media to um, don't self-censor uh, and uh, speak freely uh, about your views on the Assange case because ultimately it will impact on you. Thank yeah, you. yeah, well said, Kelly. Thank you, I agree, well said as well, Kelly. Thank you so much. All right, so we are nearly at seven o'clock and I think it's time to well and truly wrap up, although it's been such a wonderful um, hour, it would have been nice to have spent some more going through some of the other questions and comments with you all. Um, I wanted to quickly just add uh, to please sign the petition that I linked and uh, I want you to also send it to five of your friends. Uh, that would be great. It closes on the 23rd of this month. Now, importantly, uh, IPAN's public inquiry closes on the 31st of July, I believe, but the details are on their website. Please follow them on social media. I've also added our Twitter account. Please go onto our website, that's the acij.org.au, sign up to our newsletter. Um, and I really, really appreciated spending this evening with you all. Thank you so much again to IPAN, to our wonderful speakers, Greg and Kelly. Thank you. And for questions and comments and uh, friends from near and far, thank you so much. And I think I'll hand it back to Annette or anyone else at IPAN now, or do we just say goodbye? <laughs> I gotta go. All right, cheers. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. guys. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank okay. you.